We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Well, guys, welcome back uh, to an episode of the podcast. It's been a long time and uh, B and I were just discussing uh, the recent move, which is always fun, and then moves in general. And uh, it's, it's always that thing of little things taking up way more attention than you think they uh, they they deserve. But anyway, we're here now, and I'm joined by my guest today, B Muhammad. B, thanks so much for for joining me on the show. Oh, it is my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now we're actually not too far away, are we? Are you you're at your home in just in Mornington at the moment? Yes, I'm actually home in Rye and I'll be driving to the city after this to go to the dispensary part. But yeah, I'm, in, I'm just in Rye, so it's a beautiful yeah. part of the world. I yeah, yeah, no, loving it. Just getting used to it down here. So no, it's beautiful. Well, why don't you um, just tell the guest, uh, the guest, you're the guest, the listeners a little bit about who you are and, um, and, uh, and what you do because they're not always the same thing. But uh, yeah, give us a brief rundown. Yeah, for sure. So I am currently the head of patient advocacy for Astrid. Um, And Astrid is actually the first female-led medicinal cannabis dispensary in Australia. Um, So I've been in the cannabis industry, the medicinal cannabis industry, for about probably two and a half years now. It's obviously been legalised here in Australia for the last sort of, I think it'll be four years I think it was four years yesterday, actually, oh, wow. that it was, yeah, legalized in Australia when the, the um, when Dan's bill was actually enacted at the federal parliament. So, um, so yeah, what I pretty much do at Astrid is, yes, we are a dispensary, but we're not your average pharmacy, not just because we do medicinal cannabis, but my role is um, very unique in the sense that we actually help patients when it comes to Um, I guess, regulations that continue to discriminate them because they are taking progressive medicines such as medicinal cannabis. So I come in when patients get stopped randomly um, at a drug test um, when they're driving or when they get drug tested at work and their employers um, actually suspend them because they're not aware that medicinal cannabis is legalised in Australia or a patient's walking down the street and randomly searched by police and they get stopped for a small possession of drugs. So we're very different as a pharmacy because we were very well aware, I guess, of the barriers that patients face here in Australia mm-hmm. when it comes to choosing medicinal cannabis as your treatment. So we're well behind our um, peers in Canada and North America by 15 years, but we're also very much behind when it comes to regulations because as much as the federal government make that step to legalise it, there's so many regulations that continue to, I guess, stay in the same way that illicit drugs are being um, treated and, and that unfortunately has really punished a lot of our patients. So, so that's my role at Astrid. Sometimes they, um, it, it's bizarre when patients are like, I can't believe I'm calling a pharmacy as I'm being arrested. Yeah. <laughs> but they just, they just don't know where else to go, unfortunately. And we create that safe space for our patients to feel like, you know, I guess they um, are not being punished because they're taking a plant medicine, really. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I think... The, the first thing, whenever you're talking about decrim, I think what, what seems to work is, is talking about its actual benefits, you know, as opposed to just, oh, well, no, this is a fun drug, you know, why can't we legalise it? I think what gets the, the more conservative minds across the line is, no, there's actually a use for it. So would you mind, um, you got a cavalier in the back? I have a cavalier. I grew up with cavaliers. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> 
the he best. is the most beautiful dog. Unfortunately, <laughs> he's had to lose all his teeth a week ago. Oh, wow. So he's a bit confused at the moment because <laughs> he sort of went to the vet. He's like really happy. He's always happy to see the nurse there. And then when I picked him up, he was not very happy. Yeah, so, of course. <laughs> yeah, so he, he, might, um, he might jump in and say some things as well. <laughs> oh, definitely. That's the best part of the podcast when you got dogs jumping yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But, yeah, so back to the question, definitely mm. the benefit. So prior to um, being in a cannabis industry, I, I ran a not-for-profit called Scriptwise, and it was about the issue of, um, I guess, the over-prescription or over-prescribing of prescription opioids and mm. benzodiazepines in Australia. So um, I was very, very blessed that that whole initiative was actually started by the late Heath Ledger's dad who – um, I guess saw what happened to his son and what was happening in America. And then when his son, you know, I guess tragically overdosed, he received thousands of letters from a lot of families in Australia mm. who were like, this is my daughter, this is my mum, this is my dad. So I spent six years of my life, unfortunately, reading coroner's report after coroner's report of um, polypharmacy and, and I guess the sort of multiple over prescription of drugs where people unfortunately overdose and we don't talk a lot about that um, at all in Australia, I have to say, well, anything to do about the addiction space, I think is, is something that's sort of not um, in the public health sort of discussion. So, um, so for me, it was like seeing that day today was mentally challenging. I'm quite an empath myself. So <laughs> when I see something, I'm like, why is this happening? How can we change it? So while it was amazing, we got some amazing, like we got some really great outcomes during my time at Scriptwise. We were able to put some of these families in front of the federal health minister and, and say that they need to be better um, education around doctors, around the long-term use of these medications. Mm. There need to be better initiatives by the colleges uh, to ensure that they address the issue of overprescribing. And then codeine was being rescheduled six years ago because mm. of the lobbying that we did. And then just as I was leaving that actually also, we were sort of quite, um, I guess, successful in reducing the pack sizes of opioids as well. But I got to a point and that's actually when we moved down here was because I always go through moments in my life. I was like, I'm trying to address something that happens at the very end of this journey that people are already dependent. And it's usually because they genuinely suffer from chronic pain, mm. they suffer from depression, anxiety, and that's the only option they have always been given in this system. So that was when I actually uh, started meeting a lot of patients. This was probably 2015 or 14 who were illegally accessing medicinal cannabis then. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, wow, it really saved me. And they started being able to go back to work. They started being um, present again in their lives and they're suddenly a partner again and their dad again. So it was just for me like, I um, was very, very sort of like, this is where I need to be. It was my next calling, I guess. And um, and now that's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We are starting to see a lot of patients who feel like the conventional pharmaceutical drugs have not worked for them and they are like, help me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are the information? So it's not necessarily just about cannabis. Sometimes for us, it's also about, you know, if you suffer from anxiety, CBD might be a good option, but what about breath work? What about meditation? So we take our, I guess, opportunity at Astro when patients come to us because they're absolutely desperate to incorporate like a very integrative sort of approach towards their health. Mm. Yeah, I really love that response because, you know, in many ways, the conventional um, the conventional system is, is much about, you know, dealing with pain and, and, and you know, dealing with the symptom. And, and there's obviously a place yeah. for that. You know, you'd, you'd much prefer someone Absolutely. to be, um, you know, on, on SSRIs and, and not committing suicide than actually going, yes. going through with it. So there's, you know, we're not saying there's, there's not a place for that, but yeah. It, it, at the same time, if you if you're using that over and over again, it it 
does seem that it kind of erodes your agency and your autonomy and perhaps CBD and, and cannabis is one way that can pe- people can start to be open to these ideas. Okay, I actually can do things myself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you spot on a lot of patients and especially the mental health patient, which is a cause that, you know, I'm very passionate about as well. And especially patients who suffer from PTSD who come to us and they've been on these medications for a long time. They still feel numb. They can't feel their emotions. They're neither happy nor sad. They wake up the next day. They feel really groggy. They get side effects from these medications and, and cannabis in a way, medicinal cannabis in a way is that breakthrough for them. Not, not just to me, not just about the right sort of, medicine to assist them but it's almost like a big breakthrough to their to their healing process Mm. they suddenly go you know one i remember talking to a veteran and um you know he was on 20 benzodiazepines a day wow and suicide ideation was constantly every single week you know and he had to separate that that was the side effects of the medications more than than him actually and then when he finally got two medicinal cannabis and finally taper off, you know, even when he went from 20 to six a day, he said he just felt this huge weight off his chest just lifted and he finally felt hope. And that's, that's what we need to remember. It's not just about the medicine. It's, you know, being able to be consciously awakened so that you suddenly go and trust your body that you are able to heal. And I think that is so lost in the current medical system at the moment. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's just so many layers to it, but that's why I get so passionate about plant based or progressive medicine, because I think it's beyond just like, you know, I'll feel okay from my anxiety, but I think it opens a lot for a lot of people consciously as well. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I was reading um, some of the literature for, for cannabis um, just last trimester for uni, actually. And, it, you know, right. the, it, I think one of the things about cannabis at the moment, um, not necessarily just cannabis, like we were discussing with CBD and other things as well associated um, with the plant, there's, there's such a big thing in the, in the culture right now, you know, it's on every website. It's every, every person on YouTube is talking about it. And I think to some degree that actually does a disservice because, you know, like we were speaking about before conservative minds really want to know, okay, is this effective, you know, because, or is it just another drug mm. that people are going to, you know, we're going to go back to the sixties again, which I think is great by the way, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we actually want to convince people toward, you know, moving towards these progressive medicines, we, we, we need to know the science and, and, and the data. So could you speak to us about um, some of the, 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 uh, the conclusive benefits associated with, with cannabis and, and CBD? Yeah. So it's, it's something that, you know, I have to declare I'm not a medical practitioner. So what I can share is definitely based on what the government approves based on indications that are allowed in Australia, as well as anecdotal data that we receive from our patients. Mm-hmm. So, so in Australia at the moment, so, you know, obviously when it was first legalized here four years ago, it's primarily for cancer patients and epilepsy. And then it started opening a little bit more to people who suffer from MS as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the last two years is when um, the floodgates really opened here in Australia because the TJ was starting to see a lot of benefits, even with that small cohort of patients that were initially allowed through the, I guess, what they call the special access scheme in Australia. So that's how you can, I guess, access private medication in Australia, Mm -hmm. which is what medicinal cannabis is at the moment. But based on um, clinical evidence, the TGA were like looked at, um, I guess, in Canada and North America, where this medicine has been around now for 15, 20 years legally. And they started to put a community together and pretty much based on that, it was then open to chronic non-cancer pain, which really opened the floodgates. Mm, yeah. you know, it's now probably about 70% of patients in Australia are patients with chronic non-cancer pain because mm. a lot of patients, as we talked about earlier, were finding the long-term use of their prescription opioids were really no longer um I guess just helping them with sort of addressing pain relief. And then from that, it there was 
a lot of patients who also realized they were getting dependent on these medications. Mm. So 70% is definitely based on chronic pain in Australia and how legally how you are able to access these medications is you have to have tried other scheduled medications. So you have to have tried opioid medications. You have to have tried other, you know, schedule eight or schedule four medications. But then again, you know, and then I think the government started seeing more and more patients came in. So then they started also approving for anxiety and insomnia, but that's sort of parallel to what the data overseas is sort of, sort of showing. So there's a lot of the three main indications that have been proven um, I guess, to be quite effective for patients are chronic non-cancer, um, anxiety, and obviously insomnia as well because of the fact that usually what is being prescribed for these conditions don't really work for patients. And then obviously you also see a lot of um, new, I guess, real-world data that's coming up. There's some great um, clinical studies happening in Australia around gut health as well and how um, CBD really helps with irritable bowel syndrome. And so the list goes wow. on. I mean, we have to remember that this is a plan that's been around since 3000 BC. So there's so much history. And yeah. obviously research was completely stopped back in the 20s because I guess it became a prohibited drug. So, mm. um, so yeah, so it's just sort of, at the moment, that's what a lot of the patients are prescribed for indication wise. Mm, that's really powerful. I love it. Um, you know, you know, like I said, I was studying this um, last trimester and as you start going through lab reports, you get, you get a sense of how difficult it is for these scientists and researchers to actually mm -hmm. show that there is a significant association or an effect. Like I just couldn't believe you know, and we're told to write these lab reports and every time when you're our discussion, you have to say constantly where you're wrong, where you think there's bias, where you think there should be more research done. It's just so difficult to say. And I, and I understand that because you don't want people just pushing their own agenda, but it's so difficult. Like when, when there is a study or there's a group of studies that says, Hey, there's actually something here to it. The years and the pain <laughs> that, that it took to get that across the line and then to get other oh. people to back it is just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And thank you so much for raising that. Yeah. <laughs> that is the biggest barrier in Australia. Mm. We, um, we are using the pharmaceutical industry model for this medicine. Right. That is, that is not what has happened in Canada. That is not what has happened in North America. Mm. You know, they had to almost as a regulatory framework created something different to be able to consider this as still a valid medication but not be put in the same box as a pharmaceutical drug. Mm. Um, and I think four years later in Australia, that is why patients are still paying hundreds of dollars because the pharmaceutical way in Australia is you <laughs> have to register your medications. And we all know that happens two ways. You do your five to six years of phase one, phase two, phase three clinical studies. That takes millions and millions of dollars. So then only companies with those resources are able to do that. So it becomes just, you know, and obviously with cannabis, it is based on anecdotal data from mm -hmm. patients, which is not not used in the industry that we're used to. They're like, wait, a patient saying that this works for them? Yeah. It can't be that. It has to be in this box. So um so it has been the biggest like my my background is policy and regulation. So it's it's been the biggest thing of like how and there was this massive inquiry that happened last year that was actually um uh, driven by Richard Di Natale, who was literally pushing the TJ of like, we need to think differently for this medicine and potentially any other medicines that come into Australia in the mm -hmm. future. We need to be a bit more, I guess, uh, agile, but you know, you say that word and it doesn't click with the current regulatory system. Sure, sure. I have to say. So, yeah. Um, 
So yeah, it's a, it's a very good question because a lot of patients don't understand like why do I have to pay this much for my medications? And then you explain how the pharmaceutical benefit scheme work and and then we're like, you know, that will be five years away before it's being subsidised by government and what do patients do at the moment? Do we go back to our um, prescribed opioids and benzos or do we just find a financial way of using this because it does allow me to go to work. It does allow mm. me to function. Yeah, absolutely. And so could you differentiate between uh, CBD and then cannabis, just just for people who are really interested? There's a, we've got a lot of listeners who are actually really interested in, we talk a lot about um, psychedelics, plant medicine and all that kind of stuff, but cannabis is one of those things that's probably a little bit closer to, to what we could kind of see happening in the next couple of months, years. I mean, obviously for you, it's happening right now, but yeah, could you differentiate between CBD and then cannabis form? Yeah, for sure. So CBD is what everyone wants because, you know, everyone sort of goes, it doesn't have the THC psychoactive component yeah. to it. I'm safe. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to take cannabis and I'm going to be okay. So most of the time CBD is actually being prescribed for anxiety because it, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have the THC. But beyond the stigma that we have towards cannabis, there is a bigger stigma that patients have around THC. Um, because scientifically, and when you sort of, you know, I, I guess, again, I'm not a medical practitioner, but the training that we've done around medicinal cannabis is sometimes the, the small amount of THC actually helps to activate the CBD molecules in it. So we always try to explain to patients sometimes who come to us and they're like, I've never touched cannabis in my life, so I only want CBD. And if the doctor's going, well, actually, with your condition and what you're actually coming to me for, you will benefit from the molecule THC being a part of that. So I think it's it's sort of, unfortunately, CBD um, is talked a lot too much because, a like I said, it sort of looked as like, if I take this, I won't get the munchies at like 12 o'clock. You know? <laughs> nice. But then again, yeah, again, then we're like, well, sometimes you get the munchies, not because of the THC is actually the, the plant and how it's been grown, what chemicals have been used on mm. it. So when you're taking it medicinally, because of the government regulations around how companies are having to adhere to certain, you know, regulations of what chemicals you can't use on this plant and things like that, you, you know, you shouldn't get that. And we're not saying you won't, but sometimes it's also a placebo of like yes. I'm taking something with THC and it's cannabis, I'm going to get the munchie. So I think it's sort of important when we talk about cannabis and medicinal cannabis to have respect for both molecules and obviously all the other molecules that does exist in the plant, but mm. somehow CBD gets a better rep than THC because of just, um, I guess, the fact that we're so used to, you know, the government going, this is what will make you paranoid, this yeah. is what will give you the psychosis. So it's just mm -hmm. educating ourselves around the plant and the importance around that. But like I said, most of the time patients who are anxious, they are the ones that doctors would just prescribe a pure CBD. And um I'm sure a lot of patients also out there. So one of the things that happened in January at Astrid was because the regulations changed that CBD could be bought over the counter. We had like a massive amount of patients that like came in and like, where can I buy my CBD? And it's understanding again that companies, because when the TJ announced that earlier this year, companies then have to register their products so we're probably about two to three years away from getting CBD over the counter. Mm. Um, so it's just that's why there's a lot of um, interest in it because the government regulations change and so patients think I can access this now in the pharmacy or they see it on the website and they're like, this is CBD. No, and it's just even important to understand the difference around hemp CBD oil versus like pharmaceutical grade. CBD oil. So it's like you said, there's so much information out there. But if you want to be prescribed pharmaceutical medicinal grade 
cannabis, it always, always has to be through a doctor. There mm-hmm. is no way you can purchase this medicine if you do not have a prescription. And I think that's the one easiest way I'd normally explain to friends, family, like, because there's so much CBD online that you can just buy. Yeah, 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 definitely. Now, there was a lovely little uh, segue there um, discussing THC and, and, and paranoia. And I think in the past, uh, what me- the media has done to really, you know, stir our attention away from that. And I think, um, you know, when talking about CBD and progressive medicines, it's probably a good time for us to kind of move towards where you see uh, your company and, and the vision for the future um, with, with, with other plant medicines as well. So did you want to speak on that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So, so yeah, Astrid, you know, we're really sort of going back to nature and science and sort of thinking a bit more progressively. I think we're all aware that, um, you know, it, there is this movement that's happening at the moment. I think people are starting to sort of seek information. They sort of, um, as patients, they want to be informed and empowered. Um, so there's a lot of sort of, I guess, um, conversation around outside of cannabis around psilocybin and MDMA um, from our patients themselves. You know, they're mm-hmm. really interested in that space. I think not just because it's a, as sort of as a way to sort of treat the anxiety. They, they, I think a lot of patients have come to a point of the pandemic and everything. They just sort of want to commence their process of sort of being consciously awakened in a way. Mm-hmm. So at Astrid, we sort of, where our vision is, is obviously to go beyond medicinal cannabis. Um, we hopefully, you know, want to sort of be able to push in terms of um, through our veterans community as well for psilocybin to be eventually legalised in Australia. So there are conversations in the background for us as well. It's not our core business at the moment, but it's definitely a space that we um, want to get to. I think our biggest sort of barrier as a, as a company, as we would say, is that until we get the framework for cannabis right, we almost find it that it's going to be challenging to sort of open the doors to other um, progressive medicines as well. Sure. So, so for us, it's like, while well, there is, like conversations at the moment around psilocybin and DMA and where that's at with the TGA, we still feel like we need to get this current framework for medicinal cannabis, you know, I guess solid first so that it, it, we take the learnings from from this medication and, and what we have um, done really well and done not so well before we talk about psilocybin because I think with psilocybin it's even more complex Mm. in the way we have to deal with patients, you know. And there is a part of me that's sad in the sense of the the cannabis industry very quickly has become a bit of a a profit-making industry as well. And and look, you know, I I wouldn't be here if I didn't have a, a job in the cannabis industry, but we're starting to see sort of, you know, I guess patients who feel like when they go to clinics and stuff it's like a 15 minute consult they're not getting the care that they deserve so so I guess that Astra will want to try and slow down so it's not just progressive medicine it's also slow medicine we want to we want to say to patients like let's just look after you and tell us what you need and we're here to listen and we trust you as medical practitioners and everyone else that works there we trust you so I think for me it's like we need to also parallel when we're talking about progressive medicine is talk about well what is the medical system we strive to have in place before we start yeah. dispensing psilocybin because that that is something that I guess has it, it is something that I'm personally passionate about um and the process as you would know is very delicate it's sort of you know, it's it's very it's a very important process for the patient. So yeah. I I almost feel we have to get it right when it comes to psilocybin because otherwise, you know, we, we don't yeah we don't want to sort of blow that chance at, at sort of changing really changing how the system, especially for mental health, works. Yeah, I mean, I I personally couldn't agree more. I think there are a lot of people out there that are just so excited about it, you know, for fair reasons. 
But if we are way too impulsive in it, I mean, we have no idea what, what psychedelics are and what they do. We just have no idea. There are a few lab reports. Well, there's a lot of them now, but, and they show incredible results, but in terms of the fundamental Mm. structure of these things and what they do and what it means for consciousness in general, we have absolutely no idea. So to just run into that stuff and you go, all right, we're going to change the world now. It would be (laughs) super detrimental. And we saw little snippets of that, I think in the, in the sixties and well, early seventies before they were early seventies. Well, they were yeah. banned, I think. But um, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I, there's another point you mentioned there, which I really love, and I'd love you to touch on um, this idea that you know, in the beginning, you were mentioned. You know, it's like we're technically like a pharmacy, but we're not really like a pharmacy. And you kind of touched on that just there when you're actually, you know, you're prescribing these 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 medications and cannabis, etc., for your patients, but you're actually it's not just over the counter. Cool. Next. Thank you. It, it's now, how are you like, how are you taking this? What's what, what are your goals? There's, there's almost like a counseling aspect to it there as well, which I've not heard before. Yeah. Yeah. So the pharmacist, you know, I guess we, we try, I think people, you know, I have to say shout out to pharmacists out there, man. They, they don't get a lot of credit for no, what they do. True. They, they spend so much time with patients. They really sit down with patients. They, they really sort of like, you know, sort of answer any questions, sort of really spending the time and mm. also not remunerated for their time at time. So, yeah. um, but for us, it's, it's because, you know, I, I will always remember like first talking to patients when I started in the cannabis industry, you know, the one common thing that we always heard was my doctors don't hear me out. My doctors don't trust me. They don't believe me that this is not working for me. And Lisa, who's the founder of Astrid and, and I were talking like, how is it that we have a medical system in this country where patients constantly come to us and say they're not being heard? Mm-hmm. And and so I guess rather than counselling in a way, because none of mm-hmm. us are actually um, registered counsellors, but rather than counselling, we just want patients to have someone they trust and that someone just happens to be a pharmacist or a nurse. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and most of the time it's genuinely that because it's not even about the fact that, you know, I guess these patients usually um, have never had an interaction with a healthcare practitioner that's listening to them and actually going, I hear you. You know, I remember one of the patients I said, I hear you. And he's like, you know, no one's never said that to me. Yeah. And, and I think that really constantly reminds us that we can get so busy but we would rather patients sort of you know have that time with us and we spend that time when we try not to rush into it and unfortunately as well a lot of patients that come into this space into the medicinal cannabis phase it's very common that they have suffered so much trauma in their life Mm -hmm. um you know because trauma comes up not just mentally in a lot of these patients yes they have ptsd anxiety but then they also have other inflammatory disorders and diseases um so then when they come to us it's almost like it's almost like they literally just want to put their hands down and be like save me because i've been through all any medication you can name in you know the um the drug book I've been yeah. on it and and no one's hearing me out nothing's working I am numb as fuck and I'm sorry if I'm not supposed to swear but like no, they're please. literally like help you know and and we just have to listen you know and they're not sort of coming to us because like all my trauma and stuff we, we listen and then we go all right, well, CBD can help, but because we work with other holistic therapists as well, so we go, hey, would you like seeing a yoga therapist who may be on top of what you're seeing with your psychiatrist who's teaching you about CBT? Mm. You can learn how to do breath work. You can learn how to be in tune with your body when you physically feel certain things, and then Mm. they go, no one has... um, suggested that to me Mm. so we're very that's why we say nature and science at astrid because we want to bring those two worlds together Mm. you know some people think like we're cannabis they're like oh you don't believe in the science you know you guys are all like you just want like 
cannabis and psilocybin. We're like, no, we actually believe in the science around it and we want to have the science behind it. But how do we bring the other elements, not just holistically, but spiritually? So we even sometimes say to our patients, especially those with trauma, like, would you consider seeing an energy healer? Mm -hmm. Because they've done therapy for 10 years and they're like, I still feel the same. I still feel like I'm holding this thing in my body. And so we just go, have you tried energy healing? And they're like, never heard of it. Yeah. Yeah, And we just share, we just share that information. So, so I don't know what we are. We're definitely not a dispensary, obviously. (laughs) (laughs) We maybe do a bit too much, but unfortunately I I think what we see ourselves are is like a community. We want people to come to us and even if we don't have the answer or the right option for them, we will, I guess, do our best to almost like try to help them. Mm. Yeah. But I mean, even, even more so, I think like, you know, it's a, it's an it's a important point that I think we all have to remember is that you know nature is the science you know the the, the research yeah. on yoga for healing trauma is ubiquitous you know um, mindfulness meditation is everywhere you know time and time again the studies have strong associations with A B C D E all the way to Z you know it's more and more we we need to recognize you know that. Mm. these things these modalities they're considered eastern tradition and and, and woo woo they're not they're, they're very very much real and i think um oh. if we can incorporate all of them you know into an existing model that constantly needs updating um like everything does um you know we'll be better off for it so it's it's i oh. couldn't uh you know be more grateful that you're exploring these other things and say hey there's so many other things out there at the very least mm. this is life why well, should we just try some new things anyway <laughs> Oh, you're so right. I mean, when you said that, literally, like, it's almost like that was the right frequency in my ear. Like, I just felt <laughs> it in my body. I was like, you can just keep talking, Tom. Like, that is just, it's, I think it's, we're being unrealistic here. Mm-hmm. Like, that Astrid, we're almost like, some some days I would say to Lisa, it's behavioral change. That's what actually what we're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. We're trying to change people's relationship with their mind, body, and soul as well as medicine. You know, we we all we so often look in America and we're like, oh my god, you know, big opioid crisis. There's all these documentaries about stuff, and it's happening here. You know, a lot of our patients they come to us and they go, oh, I just want this to fix me. You know, and so we we really hold them back and we go, you know, the medication is not the only thing that's going to fix you. It's just another tool. You know, and it's very hard for patients to conceptualize that. They're like, but what do you mean? Like, I've suffered all these things for the last 10 years. I've always been given medication for it. So what yep. do you mean mm. I have to do the work for it as well? Mm. Mm. Um, so I think that's the biggest challenge. It may seem unrealistic at times, but like what you said, is there is a lot of evidence around some of these practices. Mm. Um and I think I always come from a personal point of view, you know, sometimes if there's a patient that I can relate and I've, I almost OD'd from CBT myself for six years through therapy. And then I found yoga and, and I was like, why the hell did no one ever, ever suggested this to me? Why did no one really explain to me the real benefits of breath work? And I yep. would normally just share my experience with a patient and, and then, They normally send me an email the next day and like, Hey, how do I, like, where do I start? Mm, mm. You know? So I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, one of the worst things about, and I'm actually an optimist. So there's a lot of things about life, (laughs) probably more things like that. I actually really like, but when it comes to self-actualization, you know, without getting too philosophical here, I suppose, but, um, (laughs) which we do on every other podcast, (laughs) but, um, you know, in, in the beginning of our journey through life as children, as infants, you know, everything is new and novel. We're looking at our bodies and we're like, oh, what does this do? Oh, well, that moves my finger down like this. And then we're constantly feeling out our bodies, you know. And then as we get older, it's kind of like that stops. And then we wonder why we feel detached from quote unquote, who we are, which is something that I hear a lot in the counseling world. It's like, well, when was the last time you explored who you were? When was the last time you held positions, did some breath work, um, sought out new circumstances and, and, and places in the world to, 
have a look at your perspective relative to when you're in your normal conventional modes and, and life being about a constant journey and exploration. It sounds cliche, but it is one of the ways that we can begin to feel like we are the creators of our worlds, you know, because we, you know, this body is mine. I can do this if, if I want to do that. I can do that over there. It's, you know, it, we have to never stop exploring. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned something, which again, I hear a lot as well is, can you help me? Cause I feel broken. I'm, you know, what was the word that you said? Yeah. Um, how do, how do, how do, um, can you fix me? You know? You and, the, and the first me, question yeah. is, um, well, how, why do you feel broken? Let's explore that yeah. first because pain treatment and all of these medicines that will help with the pain, but we need to change the relationship that you have with yourself. And that comes wow. with exploration and journeying and it's terrifying, but it's kind of the price of admission that we've all chosen. Oh my God. You know, so. Absolutely. I mean, freaking amen to everything that you just said. And I would encourage all my patients to listen to this, <laughs> this like episode because I think it's literally like, and especially patients with trauma, they are so disconnected mm -hmm. to their body, obvious for obvious, obvious reason, right? And they, they want to come back. They want to land in themselves again. But unfortunately, you know, I guess it's, it's, it's hard in this, medical system to even navigate to know what's right for you to have yeah. a mix of different therapies and by the time you go through all of that you're almost like exhausted from trying different things and so if someone would even ask like what you just said like you know how can we how can we go back to that it's like it's like the biggest question and that resonates so closely to me personally but as well as um like the veterans community, the mm. community I'm very passionate about as well, because, mm. you know, because of obviously of a lot of traumatic experiences that they have. And then when they're medically discharged and they just come back into our society, they're just supposed to just be okay. They're just mm -hmm. supposed to integrate when they're like, I was just in Afghanistan and I've seen this and my mate has like took his own life and like, mm. like, you, I, I don't know who I am anymore. Mm. So, you know, and then what do we do? We, we, we sedate them, Yeah, you know, we, we sedate them and we just sort of, and then obviously when they come to us, they're like, I think I'm wanting to be awakened now, mm. you know, mm. and that small window of opportunity that we have, mm. you know, I will hold their hands like, you know, and, and do my best. Like obviously sometimes we go beyond what, we're supposed to do as a pharmacy, but we're like, where else do they go otherwise? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one thing that you've been doing really well B, is coming back to that idea that it's a, it, the system itself requires change so that we don't, you know, outline particular people, professionals and go, well, this is what you're doing. That's wrong. This is what you're doing. We're, you know, we're all intertwined in this system, you know, that, um, that, that needs an update like, like, like everything mm. does, you know, and sometimes yes. I even broaden that idea towards, well, science is the contemporary, contemporary language of expertise. Now, mm. you know, I wonder what's coming after science because prior to science, it was philosophy and then it was mysticism and then there was alchemy. Yeah. And so I wonder what's after science now. It could be this new yeah. thing. So I don't know. That's a very deep question. That's yes. like, that's one for you to reflect on. Tom. True. True. Yeah. Maybe I'll need some of that uh, medicinal cannabis and I'll sit back for a while and have a think. <laughs> Terrifying. Oh, terrifying. Yeah, yeah. I'm literally like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Cool. Cool. Well, so, so what's next then? So what's, um, what's going on with you and the company um, for the next six months to, to year. So without going five, 10 years in the future, what's, um, what's kind of upcoming because we could have that conversation, but <laughs> We could, we could. I think what's upcoming for us is is we are growing. We are growing very fast. Yes. And I guess that's it's positive. But um our biggest challenge would be and will continue to be is how do we maintain that experience as we grow? Um so so it's just one of those things that's like, you know, the plan for the next six months, for the twelve months, for the five years to the ten years. Um, is we've always want Astrid patients to have a really, really good experience. That, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously that's never going to be 100% of the time. I mean, we're fortunate that at the moment we're probably doing that 80% of the time as we grow. Um, but I think for us it's constantly listening to our patients and 
space and the needs and sort of, you know, I guess we're very lucky that our patients feel like they can actually say to us like, hey, this is what I need more of and how do we then accommodate to that? Mm -hmm. So I think in the next six months for us is definitely making sure that patients who I guess come to us, they they continue to be looked after as they did day one or week one when we only had three patients. Wow, week and that's so cool. And Lisa were like, we're like, is, is, there, is anyone coming in? Yeah, that's <laughs> And so now, cool. we, you know, we, we probably speak to about, I would say, 80 patients a day. So it's oh, just, wow, wow. Um, so it is growing. But I think from a from a sector point of view, I think our plan at Astrid is how, how do we become, I guess, the, I hate the word company because it's very like, I feel it's just like it restricts us but we sort of how do how how do we change like how do we become that I guess entity in a way that changes what we want to see changing in this this industry Mm -hmm. um and I guess that's when our role of like being in the grassroots with patients to my role of potentially advising um certain members of politician and um relevant bodies of like we need this current system to change for patients so Mm -hmm. just in six months' time, yes, we have to look after all our patients, but in six months' time, I hope that all the workers' compensation out there in Australia, if any one of you is listening to this podcast, look at your policies and make sure that all the policies actually consider progressive medicine mm. because we have patients who are fighting their workers compensation for like 15 months and begging them to yeah. re- be remunerated for their medicinal cannabis so that's probably more of like my role as an advocacy person and astrid of what i would like to see in the next six to 12 months but we almost have to start with very small and realistic goals because if a patient can't even access and can't even um, you know, have to advocate for 15 months for the workers' compensation to pay for their medications because mm. the workers' compensation did not believe that cannabis is a viable form of treatment, then then what's the point? You know, mm. so so there's a lot to be changed and um I won't go through our strategy document review, but <laughs> <I think. laughs> another time, another time. A, Podcast yeah, two. Like, share share screen. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's sort of our aspiration is to always create the system that's better for the patient. And I think it's those small ways that we we hope to make that change. Mm, that's awesome, Dee. And the final question, um, which I was just interested up, in, you know, I didn't really, I never come in to any podcast with a set of questions, but I was just thinking based upon your history and, you know, working in cannabis and then Astrid, how is your has your work kind of changed your relationship or perspective on plant medicines or have they perhaps just kind of grown it further or is there anything that's kind of changed in that area? Yeah. I mean, I mean, part of me was like, man, I wish I had like continued pursuing my degree in psychology. I mean, I Mm. finished my degree. I just sort of went, man, I really wish I um, had done further studies, but I'm also glad I didn't because obviously I wasn't meant to. The universe is like, this is where you stop and you'll be in policy. Yeah. Um, but it's definitely sparked my interest. I think um, I'm now that person that, you know, I want to read a lot about it. I'm blessed that um, a lot of my friends and my community of people that I'm always talking to, they're all interested in the same space. So mm. um, I, was, I was sort of very lucky, I think, because growing up being half Indian, like Ayurvedic medicine has always been massive. So, you know, I always remember being free and if I'm not feeling well, my grandmother would be like, here's some like, you know, it was disgusting, but she would be like, this is turmeric nice. in a glass of milk. So she was like OG turmeric glass. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, turmeric glass. <laughs> wow, happens. awesome. She have a patent on and- that? Surely. <laughs> <laughs> And so I've always, it's always been my life. And, and I think if I'm getting a bit deeper, it's, it's always been in my blood. Mm, totally. So, so when I sort of even had cannabis like 10 years ago and stuff, I was like, this feels right. I've always been allergic somehow to um, painkillers and stuff. My body just rejects it. So it's just something that always has 
been a huge part of me and I, I believe my ancestors as well. Mm. Um, so if anything, being in the cannabis industry have really re-sparked, I guess, where I started from as a young child and being around that, you know, having turmeric or clump shoved in my teeth when I lost the poop and stuff. So mm. it's just, it's really re-sparked that knowledge and I now seek that knowledge and, um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't necessarily think it was just working in the cannabis industry as I've started my healing journey myself a few years ago, I really started to be back in tune of who I am. And that's acknowledging a lot of, um, I guess, what is in my ancestry line and, you know, um, accepting sort of the roots as well. And, and then I started to go, ah, this is where I need to be. So it sort of came together both from a personal healing journey as well as a professional career, just landed in the same place, I guess. So Yeah. Uh, they're, they're the stories I enjoy the most as well, because, you know, there is that personal as well as that. It's like, well, I'm passionate in this sort of stuff, but there's a, mm. there is a personal reason, you know, why. And, um, you know, I think finally with this conversation, I think if we could kind of bring it full circle, a lot of people seem to be, um, not not scared, but I think I suppose cautious to new alternatives and even the word progressive medicine brings with it some, you know, a whole range of, I wouldn't say baggage, but it's like, oh, what does this mean? But it's 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 you know, again, I think for me, the way I see it is it's much more about, as you say, being holistic, taking an integrative approach. And even in psychology, I mean, you know. The, the, the father of psychology, Freud, he was, he believed that everything was as a result of unconscious forces and conflicts, mm. you know, and there is some evidence for that. And then we, mm. and then we started seeing, uh, you know, uh, the minds as, as, you know, being influenced solely by behavior. So that's where the behaviorists came in. And then there yeah. was the humanistic idea. And, and now, you know, what we have is all of that together and that has comprised CBT, which is, how thoughts and feelings affect your behaviors, which also affect your, your perception of yourself. And, and, and all of that is great. So if we can see that in, in medicine, you know, it's, we're not yeah. saying opioids are terrible because they have their place and everything in the past is bad. But if we could Absolutely. string that along with these new ideas as well, we might have an even broader and better idea of what we can do for, for people in the future. So I think, it can, people can get a little bit nervous and like, oh, well, what about everything that's worked? Like, well, we're saying yes to that as well, as well. <laughs> yeah, and I think absolutely everything that you said and, and to wrap it all up, you know, the one thing I always say to patients, just listen to your body, like mm. your intuition, what feels good when you're taking it. Like it's not just, like I always say, yeah, it's not just about when you take your CBD, whether it feels good, it sits right, but mm. your food that you eat. And so all this stuff, I think it's just like trusting, like, does it really feel good? Because most of the time, like patients take some pharmaceutical drugs, they're like, I never felt good about it the next day, rah, rah, but they just keep going because mm. I think it's something that they just told to do. And I think you're right, it's just, we, we just need to be in tune and sort of trust it. And then, then it wouldn't be so overwhelming when we, you know, when we have a discussion around progressive medicines, you know, yes. <laughs> so, which also happens to be medicines that have existed yeah. for a That's very the long time. <laughs> totally. So. Totally. So, well, I mean, I mean, even the thing of like opioids, it's like, what comes from a plant too? <laughs> That's yeah. all good. Yeah. <laughs> All nature, guys. <laughs> just it chill. is nature. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why it's like nature is just so important and that's why, you know, I mean, yeah. that's why you and I are living where we're living. It's just going going back to that, like, is so, so important. That That is definitely the real medicine to all of us. Mm, absolutely. Well, B, thanks so much for coming on today. Can you hit us up with some links um, where people can find you and Astrid and, and everything that, people should um people should know about that'd be great yeah absolutely so the the main website is astrid.health so it's literally just dot health we were cool. trying to be different nice. and then like a lot of patients are like do we put a dot com there you yeah. know it's just astrid.health and and pretty much on that page there's all the information you know sort of around how to potentially access or want to have a discussion around just your health or anything so so that's the point to start and obviously on instagram we've we've just got astrid dispensary and 
and yeah those are the sort of two platforms but we're more sort of like people who just like to talk to patients directly so you know if you jump on the website and you just want to talk to one of the pharmacists or the nurses just give us a call and yeah we'll be able to help great cool well thanks so much for for doing the podcast thank you and thank you for allowing me to be yeah just a part of what you do as well absolutely cool guys hey thanks so much for listening uh i'll speak to you next week bye